Sure. How you doing, Kenny? Hoder, being no Devil's Digest. Um, I know that um, when you make a decision in the heat of the moment of a game versus watching film, maybe have a different perspective on it. So uh, bleeding the clock at the end, as well as the two decisions, deep in BYU territory to go for it on fourth down, not to kick the field goal, different perspective um, after you viewed the film? Fourth down's definitely not. Uh, 100% would do that 10 out of 10 times uh, in, those, in those games. Uh, obviously, they didn't, they didn't work, so that's not ideal. I, if, if I could go back knowing they wouldn't work, I would definitely change my mind. Uh, but not knowing if they would work or not, uh, you know, just 100% go for it. Definitely had, the, I mean, the, the end of the game was, was not good at all. Uh, I got to do a way better job uh, with the team at the end of the game. That was, that was obviously not, not good. <laughs> Probably the worst case scenario. Uh, not ideal. Would you have done the same thing, though, or would you have done something differently after you went back and thought about it more? Yeah, I mean, obviously it worked horribly. Uh, you know, if we're up, I probably would have tried to score and taken the risk of fumbling uh, over taking the, 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 what we did. You know, now if, there's, if it's a one-point lead, we have to do what we did. And that's where we got to get better. I got to coach that scenario better. I mean, I think that's the biggest takeaway is we didn't, I, I didn't do a good enough job throughout the week, and I haven't been doing a good job, enough job throughout the week of those scenarios at the end of the game. Even the Hail Mary, uh, we just didn't do a good enough job with it. So I think for me, when you look at both sides, the ball didn't do a good enough job at an end-of-the-game scenario, right? That's a reflection of me not getting those reps in practice uh, whether it's in walkthrough mode, whether it's in full speed mode, enough to be able to execute because we're going to need both those situations eventually to to win a football game, and uh, so we got to be able we got to do we got to do better, and it's literally on me because you know I have had on the sheet since Thursday we should do a walkthrough situational walkthrough, and uh, you know I cut that before the season and I had it as my plan of this is what I want to do after some off season studies with coaches and I took that out to cut time and now looking back as a horrible decision uh to cut that out and it almost came back to bite us. So we gotta do a I gotta do a better job. Uh, we're gonna start adding that walkthrough into Thursdays. Just to follow up on that, um if the team had executed well what you were trying to do, you think that it would have worked without any without a hitch? <laughs> uh I, I don't like blaming yeah, I mean, yes, if our plays are executed perfectly, they better work every time, whether it's first and 10 or second and 10. I think the great challenge in coaching is knowing what your strengths and weaknesses are. And, you know, I think the, the problem for me is knowing that I didn't invest a lot of time into that scenario and then putting our guys in a position to go run a scenario that we didn't invest a lot of time in instead of just turning around and handing it to Scott. Like, that was very stupid. Uh, and I think that's the frustrating part is if we would have had more time on task in, in that situational football that we do practice but not the amount of time we should have, uh, you know, I don't think we'd be having this conversation. But uh, I, it's my job as a head coach to know what is best for our football team. And uh, what was best for our football team was to not do what I did. Uh, hey, Kenny, Blake Neiman, Sun Devil Source. How are um, the Olympics? <laughs> <laughs> they were they're a lot of fun. They were a lot of fun. Um, looking at going into the Territorial Cup last year to going into the Territorial Cup this year, has the message changed to the team at all, given outside implications, or does it remain the same? Yeah, I mean, it's about us going and playing and preparing like we do. And like I've said to the team since I think week three is, you know, every game you win makes the next game the most important game. And the more time you win, the next game is more important. It doesn't matter who you play. It doesn't matter where you play. It's like it's the most important game because you won the last one. And if you go and win, then the next game is more important than the game you just played. This is the most important game on our schedule because we put ourselves in position for it to matter, not just from a rivalry perspective, but from a bigger perspective of achieving other, other you know, aspirations. Uh, I definitely feel like the educating people, you know, in this transfer portal age on the significance of this game is something that we're going to do. You know, we're going to bring in, we don't know what former player yet. I think uh, we've already, I uh, know we've already 
asked one guy. Hopefully he says yes. I don't want to say his name because I don't want to call him out if he says no. But if he says yes to come and talk to our guys about it and about just the history of the game so our guys can be educated on it. And then um, one thing that we're going to start doing is we're going to start doing educational sessions in the offseason about this rivalry instead of having to do it the week of the game and distracting the guys from the real thing, which is just go play smart, tough, take care of the football and worry about the team. So I think that's where I'm going to grow next year is really educate these guys on the rivalry when they get into the program, almost like a tutorial on uh, why this game matters, but not do it the week of the game, do it leading up uh, in the offseason. Doug Franz, Doug Franz Unplugged podcast. Uh, Rewatching the game yesterday, there was a good camera shot of Sam all over Scat on the late fourth down that didn't work. Was that leadership on his part showing that uh, somebody went the wrong way, Cam went the wrong way? Uh, yeah, I mean, for us, you know, like I say, we were in a huddle for three minutes there, two minutes there. Obviously, you know, are we going to call this? Are we going to call that? Are we going to call this? Are we going to call that? So I think uh, I think I kind of confused our guys, I mean, brutally honest, confused our guys a little bit in that scenario. And, you know, when you don't have everybody doing the same thing, you know, not everybody's on the same page. And when not everybody's on the same page, I think that's a reflection of coaching. Like it's our job to make sure people execute. So, uh, yeah, we didn't we didn't execute it poorly. But like I said, we should never not execute a play poorly coming off the sidelines. So I got to do a better job. We got to do a better job uh, coming off the sideline, making sure we're on the same page. I mean, it's fourth and one. We, we can't not be on the same page. And that starts and ends with me. And a couple rules geek questions. As long as you have seven men on the line of scrimmage. You can do whatever you want with the other four. So you could have Sam as the personal protector and Jordan as the punter. Snap 100%. it and throw it. And he can, he's got 15 seconds to run out the back of the end zone. 100%. We, we, 100%. Yeah. We have a play called Time Killer. It's very similar to that. And then uh, untimed down on a penalty on the offense. If it's loss of down, if that clock would have run out but an intentional grounding would have been called, does BYU get an untimed down or – is there no such thing as an untimed down on an offensive penalty? So it's funny. You can go back to, uh, to uh, that happened at Oklahoma State. Uh, Coach Arroyo was the offensive coordinator uh, for that, if you remember. And then they got a Hail Mary. I think it was Western Michigan. They got a Hail Mary called on them, and they ruled that the ruling was wrong. And they, they shouldn't have got that last play. So, uh, yeah, uh, if it would have – you know, if fits and butts were candy and nuts, whatever that saying is. But uh, that situation has already happened. And uh, to answer your question, it's kind of crazy. But go back and watch that game because that was kind of what you're, what you're asking there. And that was ruled incorrectly at that time. And uh, they've gotten that cleaned up. Coach, you talked about end-of-game execution, but kind of looking at an even, even bigger picture, you guys are getting off to hot starts in the past couple of games against ranked opponents, and then that second half has been a little bit more of a struggle. Why do you think that things have been clicking so much at the beginning of these games, and what's kind of changed going to that second half? Yeah, it's funny. Uh, so I brought up – well, it's not funny. Uh, but I brought up that with the, uh, with the team today because I think we play with a chip on our shoulder. We play really hard. And uh, I think sometimes when we, when we think we're ready to knock somebody out and they hit us back, well, we thought it was just going to continue to go this unbelievable way. And then they get us against the ropes and we've struggled to kind of bounce back. Now, at the end of the day, credit to our guys, they found ways to win the games. But we've had two opportunities in two straight weeks with three possession leads to go up four possessions with the ball in the middle of the third quarter. We fumbled one. We dropped the ball in another, and we're just that close. And then we've given up two 90-plus yard drives in the second half, right, in quick amounts of time. And I think for us, we got to find a way, similar to winning on the road, now how do we find a way to put a team away? You know, we didn't put Mississippi State away when we could have. We've had opportunities to put teams away, and we're just trying to find out how to do that. And I know it's, it's kind of weird. Uh, because, you know, we're, we are having, you know, we're winning some games, but we're still in year two. And there's still a lot of things that we're learning how to do. We, we're learning how to win on the road, which we did. We're learning how to, we still haven't learned how to, like, close out or, like, 
you know, really step on an opponent, you know, when we have some momentum in the second half. Uh, we've learned how to win at the end of games, right? We've learned how to fight back if we get punched in the face early, but we haven't learned how to fight back if we get punched in the face, right, after we've had success. So I think we're still learning how to just do that. I don't know a better way to do it. We need to do it. Because if we do it, our guys will have that confidence of like, oh, this is what it looks like. But we have to – that's three games this year out of 11 where we've had an ability to come out and be like, boom, and we, and we haven't. So us as staff, part of that is probably me. I'm a, I'm a – contrary to what people believe, I'm a conservative person, right? So I get in these like, hey, keep the ball on the ground. Don't allow a big play. And mathematically, the game should be over. As long as we don't give up a big play and we keep the clock running, the game's going to be over. Which, yes, it's worked. Does it give us all heart attacks? Yes. But we just got to be able to finish in those scenarios and then play that new strategy. Because I will say this, I'm not a fan of teams that just sling the ball around with three possession leads. Uh, I think you lose way more games than you win. And even though our games have been ugly at the end, like, we've still won those games. It's better than the alternative. Hey, Kenny, Jordan Ham, Sports, uh, Sports 360AZ. Um, you mentioned educating players in the offseason about this rivalry. Uh, if you're building out this tutorial of that rivalry, what are the first couple lessons, what are the first couple examples you would want to show to show how unique this rivalry is? Yeah, I think, obviously, we... It's in the same state, right? That's a rivalry. That's the first step, right? Not every rivalry is interstate. Two, a lot of their alumni live with our alumni within the same community, right? So now not only is it, it's not like state boundaries, it's almost like brother, sister, because you all live together. Everybody lives in the same valley together, right? And you're like, oh, where'd you go to school? It's usually one of, you know, those two options are probably the answer. So I would say it's it's very like deep because how closely connected the two schools are with their fan bases. And then I would just go through like us getting our butt kicked last year. That would be like what I would really focus on if I when explaining it is same state, everybody's friends with each other, like or for colleagues, right? They're close to each other. Some of them live in the same house. Right now, like it's close. And then we got our butt kicked last year and got embarrassed. So it's a game that matters that you got your butt kicked, that you got embarrassed. If you weren't here, like the other guys on our team got embarrassed. I got embarrassed. So you better have a little bit about yourself uh, when somebody embarrasses you like that. And they got the same quarterback returning, the same wide receiver. They got a lot of the same players returning off that football team, off a team that, you know, picked us apart. Hey, Kenny, Max Pitt, and his family. Um, kind of two-part question here. Firstly, bouncing back off the rivalry, you mentioned last year kind of how important it means for you being someone who's grown up here and who's seen the rivalry all your life. Uh, for those who maybe didn't know, can you just kind of reiterate what it means just to you personally? And secondly, obviously, you've talked about the outside noise and obviously trying to ignore it, but as of right now, do you feel like this team is currently deserving of being one of the 12 best teams in the country and competing for a national championship? Yeah. Uh, first question, obviously, I, I grew up going to these games, the rivalry games. My family grew up going to the rivalry games. So, you know, it's something that I've been, you know, regardless of where I coach throughout the country, like I would try to watch this game. If I couldn't watch all of them, like I would try to watch this game, try to record this game uh, just because it's, it's what, if you're from Arizona, like, this is like when's the when's the territorial cup? Like that's a that's a big deal. So from that perspective, it matters because it's something that's been a part of you know Thanksgiving. I think of Thanksgiving like that's part of it to me. Uh, you know my entire life. And then two, I think I think we'll find out. I mean, the, you're only as good as your next game. You're as simple as that. Like. You have to continue to prove to people constantly, right, that you're deserving of something. Do I think that the body of work that we've put together is worthy of, of it? Yes. But do I think the body of work is worthy of it if we lose a game? No. So can you get blinded by all that? No. Like somebody asked me today, one of our players, like, so what does it take for us to get into the Big 12 title game? I still don't know. 
I really don't. I know this. I know we don't get in if we lose. I know that. 100% sure we don't get in if we lose. So who cares? Like, focus on the main thing, which is us getting better over and over again. And I think uh, kind of a scapegoat answer, but that's literally all I care about is just being the best version of us today. Hey, Coach Fletcher Anderson, Crockett News. Um, from the beginning of the season to now, what do you think has been the biggest change in the team? Confidence. I definitely think our guys were, uh, they believed in themselves, but it wasn't like, it was like how, like, I think, I think now it's like we can. A little bit of, like, we should win. I think we can win. I think we can win. We're, we're working hard. Now it's like we can win. I think that mindset is great confidence. And when bad things happen, two games in a row, we've picked the ball off to win the game. Right? We've taken, gone down the field on offense to score to win a game. Like, our team is just playing really good complimentary football. Really good complimentary football. And I think that gives confidence to both sides. Offense, defense, special teams. It's taking all three phases right now for us to be where we're, where we're at. And I think that gives everybody confidence uh, in one another. So I'd say confidence. Hey, Coach. Jake Sloan, Devils Digest. <laughs> you guys come up with two more picks this week. David Robinson winning Defensive Player of the Week. How is this group, the secondary, with all the new players coming in, how have they progressed over the year in their chemistry? Yeah, I definitely think our disguises have gotten better throughout the season, just the more and more you've played together. Uh, and then the more comfort in the scheme, you know, Javen's year one in the scheme, even though he played for Coach Ward at Washington State, so there's a little bit of carryover. But I think the consistency in the scheme and then the comfort to be able to disguise things a little bit better. Uh, and then one of those was a tip ball. I mean, we talked about on Monday that we were going to get a tip ball uh, interception this week. That, that's one of our turnovers we haven't gotten. We said we got a bunch of these in spring ball. Right, we need to match the hand of the quarterback and get a tip ball interception. And for us to get that early in the game, uh, anytime something you talk about happens, it just gives great comfort. Like, oh, whoa, we talked about that. Like, we're gonna get one. I just think that calms guys down. And I think a great play, um, great play by Prince batting it down, matching the hand of the quarterback. Great play by Crook. So, and then the back end just getting more comfortable with one another. Kenny, going back to last year's territorial cup, obviously. You you guys saw the best version of Kafita and T-Mac. Um, it hasn't been the same for much of the season this year. Any insights from what you've seen on watching film of why it's looked so drastically different? Uh, I mean, T-Mac is, I mean, they're still completing. I think he's still number one in the country in receiving yards. I'm not positive. I mean, credit to you, T-Mac. You're number one in the country in receiving yards, and people are still saying you don't look the same. I don't know if that's possible. That's a... Incredible compliment, to be honest, to T-Mac, that he is the best in the country in yardage, and people still are doubting it. And I'm like, golly, this dude's unbelievable. Like, he is incredible, and they have a, a, a remarkable connection that goes back to high school. And uh, they still have that ability, and it still flashes. They still score points in bunches uh, when they get momentum. They're still extremely dangerous as a football team. But I think those two do have something special. I think some games, teams have bracketed them, and they've, like, said, okay, we're not going to let you beat us. And it's really hard to beat one person in college football. It's even harder to beat two. And uh, T-Mac still does that at times, which is what makes him, you know, a special player. But, uh, but yeah, they're, they're a dynamic duo. Any surprise at all that T-Mac, I mean, he said he's playing, obviously, in this age of college football where people kind of look out for themselves. That blue I, I don't. Got. I think you got to give – both of those kids you just mentioned a lot of credit. You know, they had some changes in their program, and those guys said they, even though they're our rival, that they wanted to stay true. They wanted to stay committed. They wanted to, to be a part of something. And for both of those guys to do that in this day and age is special, and that's something that that program should really get behind and rally behind those two special young men, especially in today's era. And there's no doubt in my mind that those two are going to finish this season and that those two are going to play as hard as they can because they have passion for their program. You know, they had a lot of opportunities this offseason, and they said, no, this is where they want to be. And you have to respect that. You have to respect two kids uh, that know what they want at their age 
and that are going to finish through with it. And uh, that that's the challenge this week is a rivalry game. I think the last time Arizona State uh, was undefeated at home was 2004. They were the 17th ranked team in the country, and they traveled to Arizona, and they lost. It's a rivalry game. Anything happens in a rivalry game. I think. I don't know if it was at Arizona or at home. I don't know. Coach, you talked about how you're not really focused too much on the Big 12 title implications and how you know you're not in if you lose. What are your thoughts to the, albeit slim, possibility that you guys win this game? You might be the highest ranked team in the Big 12, and there's still a very slight possibility that you don't even get to play for a Big 12 championship. Honestly, I haven't even thought about it. I'm a positive thinker. <laughs> All right. Now, if you ask that question to my wife, she she could probably give you a good answer. She always thinks about what's the worst thing that can happen. I always think about what's the best thing that can happen, right? That's why we've been together since we were 17, since high school, is because we're perfect for each other. And it's, uh, we're, yeah, I, I don't think about negative, like, what's the best thing, that, what's the best possible outcome? That's what's going to happen. And if it doesn't happen, well, now what's the best possible outcome? And if you just think like that over and over again, and it's contagious. Hey, Coach. Trenton Borgay is one of the few guys who's kind of stuck it out here and one of the guys that goes under the radar as a member of the Leadership Council. So what is his role as a leader kind of meant for this team, and what sort of excites you about his future potentially going down the path of being a coach? Yeah, obviously Trenton's a, a great leader, voted on the Leadership Council again. I mean, he was a captain uh, for the game last week. You know, made him a captain just because of what he's done for this program. I think it was important for people to see him step out in that field on senior night and uh, go be a part of the coin toss for what he's done for the program, uh, what he's done for the community. Uh, I just think that entire family is is all in ASU, all in Sun Devils. They've got great passion, great confidence, uh, a great voice for the program. And uh, I think Trenton's going to be a phenomenal coach in the next chapter of his life. He already is. He's been on the seven-on-seven seven circuit, you know, dicing people up left and right. And uh, when we have our games out there where we have our, our younger guys scrimmage, he calls the plays uh, for us. So we're already getting him involved, and uh, I'm just blessed to have him part of the program. Um, hey, Kenny, um, last couple of road trips have been successful. You guys getting the victory and things like that. Previous couple, um, tough to get that physicality going. What do you think has changed in this latter part of the season going on the road that's helped you guys to find your groove? I, I don't know. I really don't. Uh, our guys are, I, I, I don't know. I think maybe we're more comfortable on the road. Uh, I think our guys are getting just, you know, they're, they get used to it. You know, it, they realize it's still football. But I, I, I couldn't give you, I, you know, I give them an elite pep talk. I think that's really what it comes down to. You know, my pep talk pregame is just so good. <laughs> no, I don't even talk to the guys. You know, once when Saturday hits, my last time I actually talked to the team together is Friday night. I don't talk to the team all together at all on Saturday, so I really don't know what it is. It's uh, those guys just growing together, coming together, and trying to achieve something special, and uh, it's a credit to them. What do you think the biggest uh, impact of having guys like uh, Xavier Guillory and Javon Robinson making those crucial plays down the stretch of these big games? Yeah, so happy, so happy, happy for X Guillory. Uh, I mean, he's just battled. He's battled injuries. He's battled hamstrings. Last year he battled, and for him to make that play on senior night, critical play in the game, to swing the momentum back in our side was huge. And then for Javon, same deal. He was battling an injury. The last few weeks and for him to come back and, and make that play at the end was uh, remarkable and, and on that I mean one thing is that program we played I mean their head coach is an incredible human being I mean he is I mean the definition of of what college coaching is about the way that their quarterback sprinted down the field no quit no fight their entire team, the way they fought for him the entire game and fought for that program, that's an unbelievable program, and that's an unbelievable culture. And you could tell how good that culture was by how close that game was. And uh, that's a phenomenal team that uh, 
you know, I hope we don't have to see again because uh, they're a really good football team led by an incredible person and uh, the heart. They got the heart of a champion. And uh, I have nothing but respect for BYU in that program. Melquan's had a couple big third down conversions the past couple of weeks. Just what has he brought to this wide receiver group and this team on the leadership council? Consistency. He is consistent. Like, I, I don't know if I've ever seen him not be the exact same person every single day. It's just like every day you know what you're going to get from Stellball. And it's simple. You know, consistency wins. And uh, he's been consistent. Awesome. La last thing I'd like to say is I want to give – uh, President Crow, Dr. Rund, Graham Rossini, the uh, a shout out. You know, I think for the for the one of the few times I can honestly say their passion this season. You know, in this last year since they've really changed the model of athletics here, uh, and credit to them for changing the model of how they wanted to get athletics accomplished here, and for us to be able to get our coordinators locked up, have other position coaches locked up working on getting our other position coaches locked up currently for them to have the foresight, to have the direction, to want to make those changes, want to get things done and get them done swiftly and smoothly uh, is a credit to all three of those guys because in the new model, all three of those guys are involved in that. And I think, you know, I'm going to sit up here and people are going to say, oh, yay, the football coach. I'm just the middleman between those three and the players and the coaches. And – those three supporting at the level that they're supporting right now and backing the program at the level that they're backing it uh, to hopefully keep our staff and keep our players consistent. Uh, I think that's a special combination right now. And I think as long as we stay the course, I think that's going to be a special combination for the future. Thank you. Y'all have a great day. Go Devils.